Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Our first free speakers tonight will be Andy, John, and Alexis. Yeah. My name's Andy, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Andy. Uh, on and off today, uh, whilst I've been at work, I've been thinking, uh, I'm sharing at my home group tonight, I'm speaking at my home group tonight, and uh, that and it's, that is miraculous, you know, because before Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, uh, one, I wouldn't have been at work, I would have been around someone's house or thinking, how oh, am I going to get uh, a drink tonight, what can I sell um, who am I going to have to pay back? I can't go there because I owe them money. I'll have to keep out of there because I owe them money. You know, and, um, you know, I've got 10 minutes and 10 minutes to, uh, talk about what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I mean, what's happened in my life? What's changed? What's changed about me? All the things that have happened. I mean, 10 minutes is just not, not long enough, you know, and, uh, you know, I can often, uh, you know, gratitude, you know, I hope I, Never forget to be grateful, you know, because uh, going back to what it was like, you know, I mean, uh, said briefly there, what it was like, I mean, uh, as my uh, as my drinking got worse and worse and worse and worse, um, I, I just never ever, I never ever really thought that the, 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 the problem was me, you know, I mean, uh, I never really thought that the problem was me, you know, and um, I mean, the way that I can, the job that I do today, I'm going to deal with... Um, uh, clients that have got really quite complex needs sometimes, you know, and, uh, without this, without recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous, I would never, I wouldn't be able to, uh, let's say, uh, deliver a pint of milk, do you know what I mean? I'd probably smash it or not go, not turn up, do you know what I mean? I just, I just, just was so, um, an extreme example of self will run riot, you know, and, um, and when I first read about that, you know, and I really got, I thought that is just so me, you know, when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, after talking to doctors, talking to counsellors, you know, and um, that just, just the utter, uh, it was just so painful. It was just so painful, you know. I mean, I, I never told them anything. I mean, if I met you in a club or a nightclub, you know, I was not going to tell you, I've, I've had a fab day today. Do you know what I mean? I would be start, I would begin telling you how crap life was, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, and, and it was just, it was just misery, you know. Uh, and it was like that when I wasn't drinking, you know, it was like that when I wasn't drinking, you know, and I, I just couldn't live, uh, I know that now, I just could not live sober. I couldn't live sober like normal people. Uh, and as things got, as I said, as things got worse and worse, I, I just, I was, uh, I was just baffled, you know, I was just, I, how do people get in from what, it was just painful, do you know what I mean? And I got to that point after doctors and counselors where, uh, to cut a long story short, you know, uh, I just uh, picked up the phone, I think it was about 3 a.m. in the morning, something like that, and I phoned Alcoholics Anonymous, and there it began. You know, I was 12-step the next day, and I won't forget that 12-step call, you know, that these two guys started to talk to me about how it was for them, how they were, you know, and that identification, you know, and I was in this uh, crummy little bed set, you know, and, um, and I just thought that, there's something there, you know, and I never got that from any doctor or counsellor, you know, and that very first night I went to my first meeting, you know, and I've gotten lots of meetings, but I won't forget that meeting, you know, that sitting in that meeting and it was just something was, I just, it, it really was magic, you know, and there's no other word to describe that, you know, it was magic because, you know, and I hope that if you're new that you feel that way as well, you know, you maybe have just come back, uh, but, um, I hope that you feel like that in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, because I certainly did, you know, and uh, I just, I knew nothing, but I wanted to come back, you know, I wanted to come back. I mean, I remember going to that first meeting, I always used to share this, and I said to the guy who took me to the meeting, I said, what if they don't like me? Because that's all I was concerned about, you know, that, um, because I did, I used to look around the meeting and I'd think, he don't like me, he don't like me very much, he's just giving me a funny look, that one there. He don't like me, I'll keep away from him. And that's what my head would be like all the time, you know, and uh, just the, the chief critic, and I really was, you know. Um, 
And so when I read my Just for Today card, that kind of always stands out at me about that one, you know, Just for Today I will not criticise, not one bit, you know, because it's still there, you know, that I, that I, I, I can do that. Uh, but anyway, I, I heard what I did in that meeting, you know, and I... I just thought, I, I just have to go back, you know. And I, and I went back home, and I told my family. Um, I said, I, I'm an alcoholic. I said, I'm an alcoholic, because I didn't know what was wrong. <coughs> but you did. You knew, you know. And for the first time, another thing that was r- really miraculous is that I agreed with somebody, because I, I would disagree with you. There was there was no question at all that you were right. You were not, I, I, you know, I was going to prove it. I, you know. I always used to say I've read a book on it. I used to felt well known for that. I've read a book on it. I've never read any books. I used to read the last couple of pages so I got the gist of the story so I could tell you the end. I never read the start or the middle. You know, and I never read instructions on things. You know, I'd get those Airfix models. I would, no, need for, no need for those instructions. And wouldn't read them, you know. Don't take no notice of that. There's no need for that. Like decorating and that. I mean, I don't do anything like that. You know, I think my sponsor said don't do things like that. <laughs> Flat pack furniture. For me, it just doesn't work. You know, I can't do it. <laughs> no. I know John's a bit of a dab hand, I think. Um, but I was, uh, I heard that message, you know. Um, I used to think, oh, he said that last week. He said that he keeps saying about getting a sponsor. He, he said the same. He said getting a sponsor, you know, and then, you know, it, penny dropped. And and I got a sponsor, you know, I heard my sponsor share and I thought that it's just exactly how I was, you know, but he's not like that anymore, you know. I mean, when I, when I first arrived here, the old timers will be able to remember, I wouldn't go near you if I saw that you were smiling because I didn't do smiling. I couldn't, I, I'm keeping away from them, they're laughing, you know, because I couldn't, I just couldn't be around happy people. <laughs> I really struggled with that. And uh, today, it's completely the other way, you know. I um, would rather be around happy people, you know, like-minded people. And uh, so I asked this man to sponsor me. You know, people kept saying to me, Andy, have you got a sponsor yet? Have you got a sponsor yet? You know, and, um, and I heard this man share, and I, and I did. And I asked, I went up, and I said, will you, will you sponsor me? And he, and he agreed. I mean, I think about that today, I think... How lucky am I that he agreed to sponsor me, you know, because I was so um, full of defects in me, you know. I mean, I walked away and thought, he doesn't look very grateful that I've asked him, you know. He hasn't got, he doesn't look very happy, you know, and uh, and I did, I really did. I mean, that's just so arrogant and, and rude, you know. I mean, this man agreed to sponsor me, take me through the recovery program, you know, and... Uh, there, there, there was there was enough. I mean, I was beaten. I just knew. I knew. I, I knew that I just could not do it. I could not stay sober. You know. And again, I hope that if you knew that you that you're not, um, you know, that we've quit the debating society. You know, I couldn't. You know, just couldn't think about it anymore. Um, and I started to take actions. You know, I, I started to do what he told me to do. You know, um, if he asked me to be around his house at a certain time, I was there. You know, uh, if you asked me to read certain things, I did it. You know, and I and I and I and I sought his guidance and direction in other things. You know, because there was things that I, I just needed to check out. You know, and um, and it's still that way today. You know, there's nothing quite like that. You could talk to anybody. You know, but there's that certain things that you just need to say to my sponsor. You know, I, I couldn't. You know, and and things have just absolutely rocketed. You know, um, changed completely. You know. The course, the ch- the direction of my life has changed completely. You know, from you know, my last drink was in a cleaning cupboard with a load of mops and cleaning fluid, with the door closed, thinking, "It's finished." How did I end up here? You know, uh, how did I end up in a cleaning cupboard with a uh, uh, a little flask of brandy, guzzling for dear life? You know, and thinking I'm going to have to commit suicide because I just couldn't find a way out. That has completely turned around and changed. Everything has changed. The, the relationship with my family, um, the kind of work that I do, you know. But it, it has come out of uh, absolutely putting my recovery first, and that is the way I like it. You know, I don't, um, 
I don't have to force myself to do that, you know, it's, uh, thank God, you know, I found, you know, a home group, you know, it's, uh, it's fast approaching 20 years this year, you know, in, in September it will be 20 years, you know, um, I've got the same sponsor, I've got the same home group, you know, I don't need to change anything, you know, and when things have kind of felt a bit, you know, we're promised certain trials and those spots, normal life, I just call that, you know, um, my sponsor has said things like up your meetings, uh, get your meeting, work with newcomers, you know, and it works and it keeps working, you know. Um, so if you're new, sponsor Big Book and uh, get yourself a home group and keep coming back and uh, I'll let Big Nose come up now. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name's John and I'm an alcoholic. He really was a miserable bastard when he first turned up here, he really was. <laughs> but what a change. I mean, what a thing. I always break into a broad smile when I see Andy these days, and, um, and it's long been that way. Um, and what a privilege and an honour to have um, Steve H. down as well, who will be sharing for us tonight. I, I just, whenever I see Steve, I always think about, I actually went up to the... Um, uh, I went up to the Priston House today. I would just every every lunchtime, I I walk from West Ho where I work up to town. It's just one of my things, you know. And I have a little mooch around the shops and um, and then walk back. But this time, I took a little detour to um, the Abbey Hall, where where uh, many of us are going tomorrow. Had a little look at the Priston House. Had a little look at the uh, there's one of the um, on the paving stones. I think the paving some of the paving stones are old gravestones, and you can just make out the words "Entrance to John." On one of these paving stones, and um, honestly, have a look. On, uh, have a look tomorrow. <clears throat> and, um, and I was there, and, and I remember, and I remember one time we came out of that Friday meeting, after the meeting, on the way to before, on the way to the thick shakes, and um, Steve's lovely BMW had been done in by some scrope, you know, he smashed his uh, <coughs> smashed his front window, and he just took it. He just, he just. You know, and it's, it, he just rolled with that punch. You know, it didn't seem to phase him. You know, it didn't seem to cripple him like it would have crippled me. I thought, bloody hell. You know, that is, that is, I mean, it impressed me. You know, that, you know, that people who would, people like him who had been in here, they'd got this, uh, higher power into their lives. They were, they were just able to accept, you know, the highs and lows of living. And that is something that before I came here and got a sponsor and did the 12 steps, I couldn't do at all, you know, it was, uh, you know, I was, I was just like Andy, you know, just, uh, you know, try, you know, try, wanted to control everything, wanted to, you know, things had to go my way, you know mm. what I mean? They had to go my way, and there's still, that is my main problem, if you like, these days, you know, is, 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 you know, battling with this or trying to make sure that I'm doing enough of the spiritual AA actions that I don't fall into the trap of thinking everything's got to be done my way, because, if I let that kind of thinking, for me, if I let that kind of thinking persist, I'll inevitably take a drink again because I can't, I just don't, I'm not able to get my own way all the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, and the pain of not being, the pain of trying to run my life on self-will, you know, you know, full of fear as well. You know, it was no wonder that I, I loved alcohol so much, you know, because it just did for me something that, you know, nothing else did for me what alcohol did, nothing. You know, it just, it just took away all that pain you know, took away all that fear just for a while, you know, and I'd feel like, oh, like you hear often, you often hear people sharing meetings, you know, just the first, you know, that, where is it, Andy? You know, just the, thank you, sir, um, just the first of the ring pull or something like that, you know, or just getting the money out of the cash point, you know, I think, oh, it's all right. I managed to go to the cash point, you know, because we're, we're we're on the bones of our ass due to my drinking, you know, Steve was there on his BMW off and I was riding a push bike to the Friday meeting and, um, you know, that we had a car, but, um, you know, I'd get, I'd go to the cash point, and I'd be, and I'd be praying for enough money in there to get my vodka and my beers and my Marlboro, you know, because otherwise the, the evening would be a complete and utter write-off. You know, I mean, what am I going to do if I can't get my vodka, my, my, my tinnies, and my, and my Marlboro? You know, and um, you know, and, and if there wasn't enough money in there, I'd have to find some way of getting money. Like I think Andy was sort of sharing, you know, to find some way of getting money. You know, maybe I'd go and ask the wife's parents, you know, make up some story that I needed 30 quid, something like that. And that was what, you know, I was obsessed with alcohol. You know, I was really obsessed with alcohol because, because as I explained before, I really needed alcohol. I really, 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 really needed alcohol. 
if you had as much fear and as much resentment that I ha- as I had towards the end of my drinking, you- you'd have to drink. <laughs> no alternative, you know. And I didn't know there was another way of living, a way of living without alcohol, you know, sober. You know, just, uh, it just, I hadn't got a clue. Absolutely not a clue, you know. I mean, I, I mean, I thank God, like Andy says, you know, thank God eventually I was beaten and I rocked up to, you know, the, the Road to Recovery group of Alcoholics Anonymous Plymouth, you know. And I met this happy band, you know, the Steve and Alexis here and Wayne and, um, you know, a few other good fellows. <clears throat> and they gave me the good news. They were, just like Andy said, they, were, they, they kept on about getting a sponsor and doing the 12 steps, you know, and, and, I, was, and, I, and I too thought, Blimey, that's, that's all they seem to talk about. You know what I mean? I mean? There were some other stuff. You know, there was there were other things. I remember I remember Wayne showing one time about um, coming come back from London, I think, you know, done some exams. And he shared about the fact that if he passed these exams or if he failed these exams, it would be the right result. It would be the right result. And it was just like the incident with Steve and his BMW. You know, that just the ability to be able to accept whatever, whatever comes along. I put the footwork in. And I'll accept whatever comes along because they obviously had a they had a higher power in their life. That's what that that was the difference between them and me. I, up until then, I hadn't been taking any actions to get a higher power in my life. And I need a higher power. This is a spiritual program. I need a higher power that will solve my problem, that will that will release me from the obsession with drink, you know. But of course, I had to try. I had to get rid of self will, you know. So I so eventually, I too, you know, the the moment came. I sat in a Friday meeting and the penny dropped and thought, maybe I should do these twelve steps. You know what I mean? They all seem to, they all seem to get a lot out of it. They're all, they're all there in, in McDonald's sucking down these thick shakes, having an absolute laugh. And I'm, and I'm, you know, try, I'm, I'm laughing, <laughs> I'm laughing along with them, but I'm not really, wasn't, I was faking it to make it, as I was, they say, you know, I wasn't, I hadn't really got it. I hadn't really got it because I was just messing about. I was just treating AA like a bolt on extra, you know, and, um, you know, I had to, I had to give myself fully and completely to this simple 12 step program. And, and try and do the things that my sponsor had been telling me to do. You know, when they, they would get, I, I used to walk up, I was on the tea duty, I think, when I was first, I was sponsored into the tea duty by, um, by, by one of the guys, and, um, uh, and I was turning up, I wasn't turning up in time for the, I wasn't turning up at half past six, you know, and somebody would have turned the urn on, because uh, back at the, uh, the Priston house, we didn't, we had an urn, I think it had to come up from downstairs or something like that, it was, um, it was a laughing room of us. Um, and, and somebody else was doing this, you know. And one day I thought, no, I've got to, I've got to get there at half past six. So this, you know, I will do my bit. You know, it just, it just took me a while to get, to get to grips with this thing that I had to put this above everything else. And um, thank God the day came when I was able to do that. And, uh, and my sponsor showed me how to take my inventory. <clears throat> he showed me how to do step four of this, of this program. You know, and I wrote down all my resentments, you know, these... The, uh, and I wrote down all my fears and my inappropriate sexual conduct. And there was a, you know, there was a reasonably long list, you know what I mean? And um, uh, and some of those things I wasn't going to tell anybody, you know? Some, some to, to me, was quite dodgy stuff, you know what I mean? I wasn't going to tell anybody. Um, but I told my, in step five, I read all these things out to my sponsor over in, uh, you know, somewhere on uh, Dartmoor there. And... Um, and what, I mean, I, I mean, it's not as if I was completely ignorant of some of the spiritual uh, principles in life. You know, do somebody a good turn and what have you, and you'll get re- rewarded. And so I wasn't, I wasn't uh, ignorant of some of these things, but I was pretty crap at, pretty crap at applying them. You know what I mean? I didn't really apply. I was just self-centered and just concerned with what I could get out of life. You know, but you know, and I, but I, I shared all this stuff with my sponsor, and the bloody lights came on. You know, the book says that. You know, at step five, we may have we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. I was rocketed into the fourth dimension. I mean, I floated into the Tuesday, I floated into the Sunday meeting that was over at Peril then, and I just couldn't believe it. I just could not believe what this program had done. I was absolutely overjoyed. I mean, it would just, you know, I used to, you know, get older the wife, you know, playfully, um, like the old days, <laughs> and square her off by the shoulders and say, "There's a God. There's a God." All right, yeah, John, you know, makes a cup of tea. You know, <laughs> and, there was, and because I was just, I realized that there is a higher power. There is a God that has, that has, that has saved me. You know, and like I said the other night, I, I need to, I, I'm saved every day of this, the last 21 years of sobriety in this home group. You know, because not one day in that 21 years 
have I had the power to say so over myself? Not one. I haven't got no more power to do that than I did back in 95. You know, so I'm saved every day. Um, but, you know, but it's by doing, it's by having a sponsor, following my sponsor's suggestions, and, you know, being part of a strong home group. And uh, thanks very much. I'm Alexis, I'm an alcoholic. Did I say that a bit loud? Oh, not, not put his fingers in his ears. Um, yeah, um, thanks for all the previous speakers. Happy birthday, Road to Recovery group. I guess if you're new, you may be wondering, aren't they all taking this a bit seriously, having like some kind of a celebration about a bloody AA group? Isn't that a bit over the top? But um, I guess if you're new, you also haven't experienced the uh how well aa works you know it's uh my my transformation when i did the 12 steps i mean if you ask my parents or the people that were around me when i was drinking what it was like and if i could just tell you how i felt and you probably all relate to it uh, the the it was hor- it was really horrible it was so horrible it makes me laugh it was so it's just i've never felt anything like it since the misery uh, of being an active alcoholic who cannot find a solution. So the astonishment, when I came along to a bunch of amateurs um, who were doing, the, who were, you know, were, were pushing this uh, spiritual program, um, and it worked. And it didn't just work. It was like, oh, I don't want to drink. I'm now convinced I never have to drink again. And everything inside me has changed. It's like I, I felt the world seemed more positive. See, this, you know, no wonder I want to celebrate Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, I was, it wasn't just a bad period I was going through. It wasn't just a bit of pain. I needed a year with a therapist or something. I, I could sense my, my, my oncoming mental and physical death. It was grim. And this solved it when I least expected it and in a way that was indescribably more wonderful than I could have imagined. And that's a fact. You know, I'm not pitching something to you now. That's what it felt like. I was 23, and something happened in my life. Um, you know, I'm not singing glory, glory, hallelujah. It's a, it was a practical thing. You know, my feet were on the ground, and my parents were astonished. Everyone was was amazed what had happened to me. They couldn't believe it. They thought, when's the other shoe going to drop? When's he going to drink again? When's he going to screw up? What's, this is just another of his fads. But, you know, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still sober. And my dad keep, would love to be able to give money to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we don't take outside donations, but they, they uh, my family are very grateful. So <clears throat> that's why we celebrate it. I mean, the, you know, in a home group as well, how's, it's helped me. For a lot of people here, I know that coming to an AA meeting, that's how the message was, was carried to you. Coming to a home group where the message, the same thing was being said again and again by these people week after week. And you got it all, the, the penny dropped. You did the steps. This group wasn't around when I got sober. You, you don't, you know, you don't need this group to get sober. You, you just don't. Um, uh, I got sober before this group was started, and I had an amazing spiritual awakening through doing the 12 steps. Um, the other thing why an AA group has been very, uh, and this is where it's been more helpful to me, is keeping me around Alcoholics Anonymous, keeping me interested. AA as an idea, AA as, as a principle and action, as somewhere I can get active, be a part of a, a helping others, a social thing, it's just grown for me almost continuously over the past 20, uh, 23 years it's been. And uh, that wouldn't have been possible if I was just hanging around on my own, um, drifting from meeting to meeting. It was being part of something strong, something focused, and um, something disciplined. And discipline, a home group can't impose discipline. A sponsor can't impose discipline. But I needed to learn self-discipline when I came uh, you know, if I wanted to get so, one of the primary symptoms of my alcoholism was a total lack of self-discipline. And in the end, it wasn't about using self-discipline to stop drinking. If you're an alcoholic of my type, you will never be able to use self-discipline to stop drinking. You could be, I could, and I, I speak for myself because I, I could see my future. And that's what, what crushed me and made me willing to discipline myself to do the steps. Because that's what was important. 
wasn't trying to discipline myself to stop drinking. It was disciplining myself to do the steps. And what crushed me and made me do that, I saw my future. And I saw that I could be lying in a hospital bed at 27, bleeding out in my insides, and just thinking, I'll, I'll sort it out tomorrow. I'll discipline myself with my drinking tomorrow. It was never going to happen. What I needed was the discipline to do the 12 steps. And I was unable, when I saw those 12 steps, there was no way. There was no way I could do them. They were like in a foreign language to me. I, I, had, the, I had like posters of Einstein on my wall. I was a man of science. This, to me, was a, a fellowship. When I first, before I knew it worked, it was a fellowship of deluded idiots. Because spirituality, you know, you said you weren't religious. I don't care if you're not religious. You're still spirituality. You're still making it up as you go along. You still haven't got a clue. You're not scientific. We live in the 20th century, you know, or 20, 21st century as it is now. It was not, um, it didn't, it, it, it was, I, I needed to be shown how to turn these, these, these 12 steps into actions. And, um, I said to myself, and I sensed intuitively, once I, once I had the total in a collapse due to my drinking, uh, utter collapse, I sensed intuitively that I needed to take action urgently, precisely, and, you know, coherently. I couldn't muck, I couldn't leave it another day. I couldn't wait until I felt better. I could not wait and I had to get it right. I knew I was living on borrowed time. My sponsor didn't have to tell me any of that. That was not, I didn't go to my sponsor and he didn't say to me, you must take action immediately. You must do everything I say. You must share with me precisely. He didn't do any of that. I knew because I'd had years of being undisciplined, putting it off till tomorrow, thinking I knew better. These were, you know, yes, drink was a common thread running through my life, but the biggest thing was my defiance. Because I knew again and again in the face of terrible pain and many people's offer to try and help me, I had resisted. I had screwed up again and again. So that's what made me discipline myself to listen to the sponsor. And I, um, and as I say, the, the result was, was beyond anything I could have imagined. And that's, uh, it's a funny thing in AA. You hear that so much. It's happened so much in AA. People have spiritual awakenings. They're astonished. They're amazed. If you come to a meeting where there are a lot of spiritual awakenings, people will accuse you of being like over the top. <laughs> you know, people just seem a bit too happy. But if there's a lot of spiritual awakenings going on, how can you not be happy? And it's, it's, it's been since, you know, anyway. Um, so some of the other things as a, as a newcomer, I guess I was, I had, I thought, this AA, what, do, do I, do I need to be this obsessed? Do I need to be this involved? It's like, I kind of think sometimes if I say to a new person, yeah, I've been, I've been coming to AA for 23 years and I'm still sober. And they're like, well done. 23 years in AA? Really? Do I have to do that? Can't I just kind of do the steps and get on with my life? Here's, here's the thing. AA is all about getting on with your life. That's what it's about. I'll tell you what AA is really not about is the constant victims who drift in and out of different recovery programs and never get to live their life because they're obsessed with their alcoholism and addiction because they never recover. You know, that's what, what I'm about. I will come to AA and I will dedicate myself to Alcoholics Anonymous so that outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm free. I'm free to, I have the power to do what I want when I want it, to achieve to my greatest potential. Because my biggest enemy is me. And I come to AA to defeat me. And that is, that's the truth. And uh, some of the most free people that I have met, because in the end, freedom's about inside. Some of the most free people I've met have been in Alcoholics Anonymous, in strong, disciplined groups. You look at their lives, they've achieved things. They've gone out, they've stood out. They've stood up for things outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. They, they, they've done stuff that most people you see don't do because of the simple fact that coming to AA does not restrict me. It frees me. I mean, it'd be fine if I wasn't a self-centered, self-willed, if that wasn't my natural state, then yeah, I could just leave Alcoholics Anonymous. It would be no big deal. But that's, um, it seems to be something in me that it, it, it makes me, makes me my own worst enemy. So 
being part of a group like this, and it is, I've, I've been, this, this, is, this is a good group. And it's one of the things, um, you know, if you, if you stay in AA longer than a, a few years, you'll start thinking of leaving every so often. And if you stay in a home group with the same sponsor for more than a few years, you start thinking of getting rid of them every so often. So what's kept me around, and this is why being part of a successful, vibrant home group is so helpful for me in the long term, what's kept me around hasn't been me saying, just, damn, I've got to stop. That would have been really interesting, by the way. You can come up and ask me afterwards, and I'll tell you what kept me around. So. Thank you to our first three speakers. I would now like to introduce tonight's final speaker, Steve. Thanks very much. My name's Steve, and I'm an alcoholic. Came straight from work, as you can see. Left Bristol about two o'clock. Um, and uh, I see that we have been joined together with new and wonderful ties in the front there and a few other places. That used to be the joke. We used to have a Mickey Mouse tie um, in, in the bag that if anybody who was doing the main share um, didn't turn up uh, with a tie, they would have to wear the Mickey Mouse tie or something like that. It was a, it was a horrible tie, I remember. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I, I'm, uh, do I sound like a janner? Yeah. Excellent. I'm glad I haven't lost it. I went away, <laughs> Mike. I, I went away um, uh, 16 years ago. Uh, I went up to Bristol mainly for work and obviously joined an AA group up there. And... Um, my my earliest remember my earliest memory of uh, coming into AA down here was that I joined a group of people who used to practice steps one in twelve to perfection, and I stuck around with them, and I stayed with them uh, for about two years. And um, I have to say, I was saying to somebody before the meeting, I never felt suicidal when I was drinking, but. Blimey, I felt suicidal without the drink for about two years. Um, I never heard the word sponsor mentioned. I never heard the word steps mentioned. It may have been mentioned, but I never heard it. Um, I was shown drawings of how to stay sober. I was, um, I was told just go to meetings and just don't drink whatever you do and it'll rub off on you. I was told all sorts of things, you know. The main thing I was told is that there was a, a, a group up on the hull. No, actually, they, they were at St. Boniface at the time, and then they moved up onto the hull um, called the Joys of Recovery. I think they're probably still around. But at that time, I was told, whatever you do, by a guy that was helping me, he wasn't my sponsor. He hadn't taken the steps or anything, I don't think. He said, whatever you do, don't go there because they're liars. They're the God Squad. Um... They, they get coat hangers and they put them in their mouth and they're smiling all the time. <laughs> this is what I was told. Just don't go there. They're liars. It's not real AA. And that is the truth, honestly. So I went, as we do, and I was gobsmacked. I was just blown away up at St. Boniface College. Uh, Wayne was there, a few other members. And um, I was going through divorce at the time. Um, I stopped drinking, woke up alongside my wife and thought, who the hell is this? Didn't have a clue who she was. Um, and I decided to get divorced. No sponsorship, no steps, nothing, you know. So I went up to this place. I started whinging and moaning and about my wife as usual, as I did every meeting I went to. Um, and um, this big guy looked up. And I wasn't going to argue with him. He was big. And he said, why don't you just shut up and listen to what we're saying? And it changed my life. I, nobody had ever spoken to me like that. I was a, I was a Plymouth Argyle football hooligan, and I used to go down Union Street fighting nearly every Saturday, with and without the drink. Didn't bother me. This bloke had something. And uh, this meeting, the Joys of Recovery, moved up to the hole. And at that time, I wanted a sponsor. I wanted what the guy around the corner for me had. I was 18 months without a drink. He was three months without a drink, and he had more than me. And he was teaching me about the big book and everything else. He had to sponsor 
in London called, called David B. And I, I said to him, this guy, I said, why don't you come around to my place and uh, uh, we'll have a little chat about the steps. I'll get the big book out and, you know, thinking that maybe I would sponsor him. I had nothing to do, <coughs> nothing at all. And um, he said that I would do, he said, but I've been told by my sponsor if I want to stay sober to stay well away from you. <laughs> <coughs> and I said, well, you know my nickname, Builder Steve. He said, no. He said, it's Angry Steve. I said, really? So everybody in AA was calling me Builder Steve to my face, but behind my back, Wayne's laughing, he knew, uh, <coughs> calling me Angry Steve. So anyway, I, I wanted what he had. I got this sponsor and um, in London. Um, I went to the joys of recovery on the whole, and things started to go stale. They really did. There were, there were members that we looked up to who had been around for 10 to 15 years at that time. And there weren't many around that had been around that long. And they stopped sharing. It was as though they, they'd felt it was really spiritual not to say anything at the meeting. And they would just sit there with their finger on their mouth like this and just say nothing. And I know that uh, Alex was there and Wayne was there. And I know that, that Wayne questioned this to the sponsor. I never said nothing. That was me always, uh, you know, ready to be led. And... Uh, um, Wayne had the same sponsor as me in London at the time. And uh, he was told, uh, well, if you don't like it, then form your own group. So Wayne said to me, I'm going to form my own group. Alex was up for it. And I said, well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm, it's all right here. And so I went. I went with him. I just, just followed. And we went down to this cold. You guys have been saying what a beautiful building it is down, down at, uh, what's it called, Alex? Was the pristine chapel? I could never remember that name. It was cold. It was freezing. There were stone walls. There was never any heating. It was a nightmare. I mean, honestly, the meetings were great, but it was an absolute nightmare of a building, you know. And I can remember one night we decided to. Uh, there was probably eight of us, and we decided to have a steering committee. This steering committee went, it went on from 9 p.m. when the meeting finished till midnight. It was gone midnight when we left. We were sat there with gloves on. We were sat there with little woolly hats. And we were all having our little say. And I said, I've had enough of this. So this is what I did based on a resentment. I'll tell you what I did on a resentment, right? In the same street, right, <laughs> um, 15 minutes earlier, I formed another group and we had a meeting on the same night as the roads, right? I was really upset, you know? <laughs> they say the best meetings are formed, uh, you know, with a, with a coffee pot and a resentment. Well, that was me, you know. I eventually went back. Um, it wasn't a bad meeting down there, but, you know, it wasn't the roads, and, and that was it. Um, I can remember one night, the quietest member he had joined by this time, uh, John, um, now, I thought he's a classical music fan. He, he, he's that type. He's very, very quiet. This American came into our meeting, <clears throat> and um, he had long hair, and uh, he had a woolly hat on. He looked quite cool, actually. And uh, John looked up after a little while and said, he's a member of that uh, heavy metal band playing in Plymouth. Now, how did he know? You know, I mean... He's the last person I would have expected to be a heavy metal fan. Anyway, this guy, he, he came across the meet, meeting with us. He came across to the meeting after the meeting over um, over at McDonald's. And uh, we had a great evening. And uh, and I think John even went to see him at some other time. I was so surprised by that, that you actually knew who it was. I have a clue. I am now a heavy metal fan, I have to say. Um, I can remember when... A young lady came to the meeting, and uh, drunk, and we had uh, a visitor from Tor Point, uh, a, a, a male member, uh, many years sober, a lot long sober than us, and this lady decided to kick off and uh, lift her top up, and this is at the meeting, um, and uh, she had to be restrained by this other guy that was the guest speaker that evening from Tor Point. And it was so funny. There was this lady that was, that was topless. She also went topless in McDonald's with the coffee after. <laughs> yeah, this is true. 
and and um, uh, they started rolling around the floor together. He was trying to restrain her. She just went mental. She just went nuts. Yeah. Oh God. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, what with, with my with my recovery, what I have to say is I, I got this sponsor and I took I took this step. And I have to say that was uh, over twenty seven years ago, um, twenty seven and a bit years ago, and uh, uh, not once has a thought of a drink returned after I took that step five in Chelsea that day. And I mean that. And I couldn't stand in front of you guys, my my friends, my new friends, and say that. It has never returned. I've gone through all sorts of situations. I mean, I my, 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 spon my sponsor at the time, who's over there, got me out of a situation where um, I was nine years sober and I just completely lost the plot because I'm not perfect. I lost the plot um, uh, over the woman I thought understood and uh, um, he got me out of that situation and um, I'm losing my train of thought here. When I said the woman I understood, I sort of lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'd been through that. I was engaged and basically she was seeing someone else. So I was in bits and my sponsor got me out of a situation. Um, I'd lost my mum in AA and I stood firm for the family at the funeral. I've lost my dad when I was in AA, both Plymouthians. And I, uh, the, the rest of the family was falling apart and I was there. Um, very, very firm and just being strong for them. Um, I've lost a company. We, we were based in London, Reading, Bristol, Exeter and Plymouth um, in the construction industry. I lost that in AA. That was pretty devastating because I've always had this fear of financial insecurity. But I stood, I stood firm and I started up another company, um, which is doing very well. And just recently, uh, the ultimate, if, if, if ever I thought that, that staying sober was going to be difficult and getting the higher power through the steps, if ever I thought that that was going to be difficult and surrendering on a daily basis, um, I was diagnosed with, with cancer about uh, three months ago. And um, I'm going through treatment now. And when I was told, it was just, obviously it was a bit of numbness, but I immediately dropped to my knees, you know, because that's what we do. That is what we do. If I didn't have that, and, and I, I receive relief, whatever is going to be, is going to be. And I'm receiving excellent treatment in Bristol. Um, you know, and I've been through that. Now, life-threatening, I never, ever thought. I mean, we've all got a fear of death and everything else. I never, ever thought I could face that. You know, uh, holding my he head up high, and and uh, as my dad would say, as being a man and and not going to bits. You know, the next day I was at work. You know, I was going along for my treatment. I'm, uh, treatment is going quite well as far as I know at the moment. You know, and I've got more treatment to have, and uh, all is well. And I hope to I hope to pull through. I've been incredibly positive. It's okay as Alex is sharing about having a po positive mind and, and talking myself into the program, that, that doesn't work. Through these steps, I developed a higher power and I really go to church. You know, I, I wouldn't really say I was religious, you know, but I've got that higher power that I can't really explain. It, it just comes when the poo hits the fan. I mean, it really does. Um, and it's an amazing thing. Um, I was going to share about something else and sort of drying up really um, yeah I think I'm going to end it there early alright thanks very much thank you thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the podcast Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.